Hola, mi gente. This is Philip Johnson, uh, producer with Uno Souls, and I'm introducing Brigida Toronio. Hello there, Philip. How are you? Hi, I'm good. How are you? Good, thanks. And Brigida is the host of Uno Souls, as I'm sure you all know. And this week we are um, talking with Diane Canny. And um, I know she's been working on a quilt project, um, which there are, we'll get into a lot of the details. But what stood out for you from the conversation, Brigida? I so enjoyed my conversation, my, my chat with Diane. Um, really, the significance of it is huge. Uh, it's, it's a COVID quilt, and it, it shows um, people that have passed away from COVID, mm -hmm. and so family members send in um, a quilt that they've done, and she really has facilitated that by even sending people that are interested in doing it um, a kit with with the paper they can use, with the paint and paint brushes. She's really making it easy for people to be able to honor their family member that they lost through COVID. Yeah, I really that's think so this important. is gonna be, yeah, such a historical item that I wouldn't be surprised could be in a museum. And I think that's her goal, that it will be in a museum one day. Yeah, yeah, you know, I, um, I think that just, finding these ways of connection to each other, creating together, you know, um, and you know, sadly honoring our loved ones um, with the quilt, you know, it's different ways that we're being brought together, which I think is, you know, a silver lining that comes out of these times that we're in. And it's important, you know, it's important to remain connected to yourself and then, you know, to your loved ones and to the larger community. Yeah. Um, so let's just jump right into it and listen to this conversation. Sounds good. Thank you. Hello, everyone. How are you doing? My name is Brigida Toruño, and welcome to Uno Souls Chat. As we are all adjusting to this greatly changed societal situation, I've been called to chat with Uno Souls, and they are people that are beacons of light in our community. They were beacons of light before COVID-19, and they continue to be just that. We want to connect all of us together in hope, courage, and love. I am honored to be chatting today with Diane Canny, an Uno Soul. She is the founder of the COVID-19 U.S. Honor Quilt Project. Welcome, Diane. Thank you very much for having me. I, lo I love your show and I love the, and I'm very flattered at even being called or being part of a group of people that are, would be beacons of light. So I oh, absolutely. That. Yes, you are. Thank you so Thank much. You. I would love to know how have you been coping through this surreal time? Well, I, I think like everyone, I don't I think no lives have been untouched when you think even across the globe, probably. So um, like everyone else, um, you know, being isolated, and you know, feeling kind of helpless, um, I, I was looking for ways to try to take action and do something that's kind of been something I've always done. And I also, um, I have a 95 year old mother who lives in Florida. And like many of us who have, have elderly relatives, we, it's very difficult to look after them or help them or, or support them long distance. Yeah. So um, I was calling her more, I was planning her birthday party at 95, long distance. And, I would, and this, the size of the people were getting increasingly small to the point where, where she lives said, I'm sorry, we can't even have five of her friends. Wow. So I called and said, mom, I'm so, cause I planned all these things for little activities, gifts for all of them. And I finally said, mother, what can I do? You know, I can't come down there. How could I make your birthday? It's a really big number. Um, and then she reminds me, please don't mention that again, Diane. My mother considers herself, but she's a very lucid, very lively. In fact, she's a cougar. My mother married a younger man when she was 87 and he was 84. Oh. He looks like, uh, yes, Clark Gable. He's very handsome and he plays the trumpet still at 92. Awesome. So my mother considers herself very much alive and uh, it actually had planned a cruise that she had to cancel at 95. Uh, oh. So my mother said, Diane, you know, I have all these things and you had planned this large party, but um, why don't you, instead of giving me a gift, why don't you do something to help people during this pandemic feel better? And oh. I said, I said, oh, great mother. You know, I, you could have picked something hard like a new sweater, but instead <laughs> I have this huge noble undertaking right. <laughs> um, that to try to bring some unity and something. Um, and then how do we do this? 
mother, you're in Florida, she's 95. I said, well, I would have to come up with something. So we had, coincidentally, we had both watched um, a show on the AIDS quilt. And you know, the AIDS quilt is a virus. And uh, like that, um, you know, on another personal note, many years ago, I had worked as a dental hygienist. And at that time in my life, the AIDS, I would go to work like the frontline workers are now. And every day I would worry that I could contract um, AIDS by my occupation. Um, because we all know that is now one of the number one highest risk occupations under um, COVID is okay. dental hygiene. Wow. Um, so the more time that is spent there than even dentists do and the aerosol, aerosols with cleaning teeth. So, so I lived through that and was always thinking how sad, you know, so I was very careful back then and, and felt helpless then, but I needed that job. I had to go to work and I had to take care of my patients the same way I see these first responders are, are doing this now. Um, so, so that's where I, I thought after watching, and I was very impressed, you know, the AIDS quote was started by, um, Cleve Jones, who had AIDS when he was 25. Uh, okay. He is now 69 years old because of the action taken by creating this interest in the public in an area that people were even uncomfortable discussing. You know, it largely affected the gay population in San Francisco. And it became a national movement, but there were treatments. And this man is 69 because of a simple action and a lot of energy and 30 years later, and so I looked at that project, which you sh actually the AIDS quilt was three by six foot quilts that were the size of a coffin. Wow. Oh, so okay. it was representing those who were lost um, yeah, families. Yeah. And so that was, uh, but it was not political like mine is. It was just a message. Well, if you look at the scale of the coronavirus, uh, it would be so, it's, it's so many more times in just a few months, nine That's months right. now. Yeah versus yeah. 30 years. If I tried to make quilts that size, you would not have enough real estate to display them. And then, and actually now those AIDS quilts in 30 years weigh 57 tons. They are stored in a massive warehouse in, Cal in um, Georgia. Oh. So they become a huge undertaking even to care for. So I looked at that project. I was very inspired how effective it was and how it connected people. It wasn't expensive. And it, it kind of, um, it created a movement uh, in a positive way, um, and it, it evoked great change. I mean, uh, Elizabeth Tiller gave lots of her beautiful jewelry, millions and millions of dollars, and lives were saved and definitely changed. So we have a pandemic that um, is it's an invisible enemy, and I thought, well, how could we do something similar, but the scale is so large, and I looked around, and nobody was doing, there are people doing similar projects, but nothing to um, a scale that I thought we could go nationally with. So we came up with a size of a square. I can use more my squares. Um, so it's, we're, we're actually using um, an 11 inch square to start with. So it's just okay. a piece of cotton. Okay. And when you, what's interesting about quilts, why would you pick quilts And I think years ago? So when you think of America or even Europe, uh, quilts are kind of the fabric of the nation. When, when Absolutely. People, I mean, when people, um, when the, the westward migration. We, we happen to have a winery named 50 West. It's on Route 50, which is still the longest road in America. It, that was a westward migration. It goes from um, Washington, D.C. area where George Washington surveyed Route 50 all the way out to California. And oh. along that journey, people would be wrapped in quilts. And uh, people, women often died in childbirth. Or if baby, they would wrap people in quilts for comfort. And when they died, they were buried in quilts. So quilts became, um, that's a memorial quilt. Then we have quilts in America that have been used for uh, the military. So they call those valor quilts. And for years, they've been making them for servicemen. So they're a certain size, they're a pretty good size too. So I thought, how do we combine a memorial quilt and a valor quilt in something like this project and focus on the same kind of virus that needs to have treatment and a cure for all Americans. And that's where the project began. My mother saying, and I thought, well, she could do this. She lives in a, um, uh, in a like a retirement community called John Knox in Florida, where they have lots of quilters. Um, they have a very vital, you know, if you're in the, I, in fact, 15 of these squares have come from people in their nineties. Uh, one of the gentlemen, and, and she, my mother is my South Florida, um, uh, I guess she's our, our um, operations manager from South okay. Florida. And her, and her dear her dear husband is our logistics officer because I send him supplies and he opens up the boxes and he puts them 
COVID, we put them in little COVID safe bags and then they're put into mailboxes for those who would like to make a panel. So, uh, so, so it's been very, um, it was fun. And I could tell my mother's mood improved because you know she went from being, you know, as, as you get older and you, all of us were isolated, we all were getting depressed. I know I was, you know. Uh, so just by having her have a new project that made her feel like she was doing something. And, and also where she lives, uh, they were making, they were holding up posters. So when the workers would come in, they would all applaud from their, you know, their balconies or their wind, like in New York City. So in yes. New York City, remember at seven o'clock, people would bang on pots. Yes. But as the pandemic is getting worse, no one is making noise and banging on pots and thanking people for the incredible work that they're doing. And it's, and it's with the numbers increasing, it must be tremendously anxious to do that. Um, so that's sort of the beginning of that story. And, and as a winery owner, I, I actually had one of my customers come in when I first started the project. And she said, I want to thank you for this. And she said, my daughter is an ER physician. She was six months pregnant when the virus really hit as an ER physician. So she said the anxiety she went through just going to work and coming home. Fortunately, she had a healthy baby, but she's oh, back goodness. at work now. So yeah, when you, you know, yeah. so that just I'm like that story just you know stuck me thinking you know it's that hard enough being in the art you know physician, but imagine worrying about two people at the same time when when we weren't even sure about how this affected you know babies you know in the placenta how how did that affect it? so I I just thought that was very brave of her to yeah and she didn't call out sick or take early leave she stayed on the front lines. Wow, that's amazing. So, um, so Diane, I mean, it's, it sounds like an amazing way that this started. Your mother sort of presented this opportunity for you, like, yes. almost a challenge, you know, like, a you know, challenge. This, this is what I would like done. And, um, and so, so the, the panels are sort of in gratitude for yes. this, for the um, frontline workers, yes. right? And yes. what are other reasons people can send in a panel? And I want to hear all about the process of that and how people can okay. send in their quilts. Well, we, no, we, we have, so, so we've actually made our name a little bit easier. So we're now we're calling ourselves the Hope Quilt, but the okay. same, you know, we were the COVID-19 US, and it is still a US honor quilt. And our, our, we have a mission of, actually our slogan is together we will heal. Because just like making oh, quilts, nice. when you bring pieces from across the country or even to make a quilt, um, it's a it's a together uh, you know and, and actually one of the interesting things if you look at beautiful quilts they never have all the same color or the same shape so it's the uniqueness of each individual square that really makes a quilt beautiful and memorable uh, mm -hmm. so I thought what a what a great metaphor for essentially a divided nation but we That's all right. share a common enemy that we cannot see yeah. Uh, so, so I thought this is the time also, I thought, to try to bring that unity, hope, and remembrance. So our mission first is to honor frontline workers, these soldiers, essentially. Mm -hmm. And then the second half is to memorialize those who have either suffered greatly or died um, from COVID-19. Mm -hmm. So uh, that I had learned um, when I, and I also am a portrait artist, so I thought, wouldn't it be nice to try to figure out a way, you know, one of the challenges with COVID is grieving. And because of the ice, the nature of the required social distancing and isolation, when people get COVID, um, they are isolated in a hospital, your family members may not be able to see you. That's you right. essentially get sick and you may die alone. And yeah. when you leave your family's hand of these probably sterilized, whatever, you know, personal effects, and it's a very, they send you out the door and you can't have a proper funeral because people can't again gather. So it's yeah. one of the first times in our nation that there has not been an opportunity to grieve. And when you think of the number of people, someone gave me a great analogy. They said, if you took 200 airplanes filled with passengers and they all crashed the same day, mm -hmm. that's the numbers we're talking about. Mm -hmm. And if we all wow. like, if you, if you see that now we would do something dramatic that happened tomorrow we would all be up in arms like we've got to fix this problem this is terrible so yeah. that that's still so then think of all the families affected and the domino effect of these lives 
that mm -hmm. I want, I, my concern was if Anne was as exciting that we have, when I started this, there was no vaccine on the horizon and no right. treatments available. Mm -hmm. And personally, um, another way of relating to the COVID, personally as a winery owner, very early on in the process, um, I have um, H2A farm workers that we bring in from Mexico and some of them were completely asymptomatic um, it was very difficult to, for me to get them tested, but eventually it ended up that several of them got the virus. And I realized that the health department really didn't have what they needed at that point in time to treat them or take care of them. So that was a very, and then I had to put them, isolate them, and some hotels would take them and others would tell you to check them out. So it was, the, it, I know the reaction from personal level, and I was being extremely vigilant as a, as a property owner. And fortunately, in all their cases, you know, these are pretty young, healthy people. Although two of them I had to call an ambulance twice for, and these are young people in their twenties that are very physically fit, which also was scary thinking it's interesting and hard to predict. And That's right. for, fortunately they all got better, but I was even saying, I, I actually was paying them to stay in and had to have food delivered. Met, you know, I brought, I, when I went to go look for treatments, it's, you know, there's not much there. It's, you know, right. health or temperature. So I learned firsthand that um, I was limited in how I could help them. And I realized that we, it was too overwhelming at that point for our government. So, so now that also was part of my um, experience. And so that kind of led me to looking for ways. And now even having a business, because I was a frontline worker, I would, I would think we are extraordinarily, at both Sunset Hills and 50 West, we're extraordinarily focused on very COVID safe and you know lots of sanitization. We don't have people sitting close. We could probably have a lot more people come, but I don't want to risk my employees or my customers um, as part of the same spirit of you know, how do we deal with COVID. Uh, but on the other hand, I also see a tremendous pent up need for people to be able to sit even in an open air setting, listening to music as kind of a calming therapeutic release for this feeling of being isolated and scared. Yeah. So, so, so it's on many personal levels, it's been an, an observation for me to you know, watch people just visually relax, feeling like it's okay. Just for today, I feel okay and safe. That's right. As a matter of fact, um, now that you're mentioning your wineries, um, I'd love us to pause for, um, for some nice words about, about your winery, if you don't mind. Uh, sure. Well, my husband and I, you know, I want people to know we, we didn't come from any, like fancy family, families. My, my sassy mom would tell me I worked three jobs at one point. So I'm very proud that my husband and I, who you know, it's kind of the American dream. So we, we didn't come from uh, any great means, just, you know, went to work hard in school. And uh, so the winery was uh, started as uh, we wanted to live. We came from South Florida, which you don't, you don't have this beautiful open land that we have in uh, Virginia. Um, so we love the rolling hills. And I know most things are strip malls and lots of concrete in South Florida. So uh, so we decided to um, try to move a little bit farther west. My husband likes to bike ride. So we, we found some property near Percival that was very well suited to grow grapes at a time when there were only four other wineries um, in Loudoun County. Now there's probably almost 50 at this point. Yes. So, and, and we wanted to be very authentic. Uh, so we decided to put in our, you know, grow our own fruit on site and hand tend them. Uh, we also uh, started with having vineyards on our property. I worked for the government at the time, and, um, and my husband had started a technology company. My husband's a physicist. Uh, so we were both working long hours, and we would come home and uh, take care of the vines as a hobby. And we started selling our grapes to some local wineries, and they, the wine was excellent because we took we did we hired great consultants, and we undercropped. And we I don't like lots of chemicals, and we try to use you know, healthy, uh, we bring, uh, let's see, we actually have uh, ladybugs that, you know, that they'll eat aphids versus, you know, spraying heavily. So we're, I'm very focused on healthy things around our product. So, um, so we also, behind us, my neighbor was, there was a potential subdivision of an old farm. It's an 1870 old farm that was quite in disrepair. I mean, boards would fly off in the wind. And at some point we approached our neighbors and said, we'd rather than subdividing it and having someone tear this old barn down that was all built by Germans in 1870, can we arrange a way of buying it from you? So my husband was able to sell his technology company at the time. And instead of retiring, we decided to start making wine. 
And oh, wonderful. I, and so I would say, and so actually we hired six Amish brothers uh, because here we have a technology person, a physicist, and we thought how wonderful to take an old barn and use old world craftsmen. So we had six Amish brothers, Sylvan, Gideon, Christopher, Eli, Amos, and Stephen, and they would be driven here. They don't drive, they drive horse and buggies. They were driven here from Lancaster and they would work, uh, it took us one year to renovate it. So we have a historically beautiful property, but it has solar panels across the back ceiling. It has a radiant heated floor. Um, so it has, it's a very smart barn, but very historically authentic. So that, um, you know, we, it's, that's all part of the how we like to do things. We, we actually had the Amish use corn cobs and nutshells in a kind of a sandblaster and they blasted every board so we could save every piece of wood from the inside and outside that we could salvage to use in the barn. So it looks very, um, has huge big beam ceilings. It was all built by hand. Wonderful. Well, and we actually, you, Diane. Yes, and I was going to tell you one of the tie-in is yeah. that we also, yeah. uh, we do lots of philanthropic things. So I call it making great wine for the greater good. And I would call this project, what I'm doing now, ties into that, how do you help the greater good? Because it's, you know, making wine is one thing, but what do you do with this property? And, you know, so, you know, we do things for, you know, special needs kids. It's a beautiful property and a place to use. How do we share and give that back? You know, yeah. um, that's what, so that kind of fits in our that's saying. Wonderful. That's wonderful. What a wonderful connection. Thank you so much. But yeah, so I mean, if we could continue now with the quilts, I, I would love to, if you have samples you can show yes, us. I and I know that, you know, the Washington Post did an article. Today is December 1st, yes. finally December. Uh, <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, so we were very, you know, when we began, you know, again, this is very, we, this is August, so this is a lot of traction to have made, uh, starting with my mom mm -hmm. and I, and now I bet I have almost, we'll have almost 500 panels that have been sent in from people all over the country, and if you go to our website, which is now www.hopequilt.org, uh, okay. and you select gallery, everything on the website is there that you need to participate, and if you'd like to, people want to make their own panels, to honor a frontline worker. I have some beautiful panels from quilters, but it can be as simple as just using, you know, Sharpies on a piece of fabric, just saying, you know, thank you frontline workers and okay. saying what, you know, where you're from. We ask people to put their first name and maybe the state they're from. Okay. Uh, but on, so that's the, uh, so, and those are now, we are now on our fourth quilt that we've been making. They're 50 by 50 inch quilts. And, um, I, there's a picture of one of them on the website. We'll have four of them next. And my goal is to have them in a National Museum, the Smithsonian, or the Portrait Gallery, which is why, as a portrait artist, I have also focused on the faces of COVID. So it's the faces and the stories behind them that I find very moving and compelling. Um, wow, and what today, a beautiful story you're, you're telling and helping people to to memorialize. Um, well, and it's, and it's, it's, this is the sad part. You know, and when I first started, I couldn't find any one who would admit that they had a family member who died of COVID. When I first started, there was a very strong stigma that people were embarrassed or ashamed to admit that. So you wouldn't see any obituaries or people wouldn't comment. It's getting better now. Um, and I'm now with my project, people are sending these to me. So currently I'm doing them for no charge and I do them at night when I'm not running our project because I find painting to be very um, uh, interesting. And I try to weave their stories together I'll show you um, one of the ones I did for um, one of my friends, uh, not friends, what, a, a woman emailed me that she had lost her mother and her mother's name is Helga. So she, Helga's a very, was a very, very happy German woman, a very bright lady. And uh, she had also um, used to live in Florida and she would feed a, she would, she would leave fish out for this blue heron. So I decided to add so I worked the blue heron and, and Holga, she said, you know, loved going to Bavaria. She loved, oh. uh, you know, all the Bavarian food. You know, I think she worked for the Bavarian, you know, the, the government many years ago. So, and this was one of her favorite blouses. And then she oh. loved, uh, she loved Edelweiss. So oh. I added in her favorite flower and I put her in her favorite dress and that's wearing beautiful. one of her necklaces. So, so that's an example. So what I'm trying to do with the families is um, include with them things that they find very important. Um, now, this is what I'm doing um, of um, Nisi. Her, her sister uh, requested that we do hers. So I'm just in the process of working on hers. So, oh, I'll, so I'll get it to, a, so I'll get it, sorry, it's still a little bit wet here. 
So I'll get it to a point and then I will send a picture and say, okay, well now what do we want to add in the background? I know, um, she, loved, I know she loved cats. And you know, if she went to school, I might put in her alma mater. And, okay. and, and in her case, she died at 39. Mm. Um, so that's very, very young. Um, yes. So, and I just got one, I was gonna show you, I just got one from a physician. Um, actually, he's a writer. So this is his photograph. Now the photograph I received from him, he was not in scrubs, okay. but, he, but he contracted COVID as an ER doctor uh, working um, uh, in Southern Virginia. So, and he's also, he's written three books. He's climbed mountains and he, you know, he didn't have to keep working. This is a man who could have easily retired and left, but he said that he was dedicated. You know, he was, he's a wonderful person. So I just started sketching him. And I decided oh. to put, I, I wanted to put him in scrubs, but mm -hmm. I've also put, I put his book covers. He's written three. Oh, so, wonderful. So, so I'm going to incorporate. Um, and so when the family, it, I, my next step is to figure out once I put them in the, if they become part of our quilt, I might find a way to make a copy. So the family has for themselves, um, I'm probably going to send them their own canvas so that they have it at home to remind what a them. What great them. idea. Very nice. Oh, and my last one is a painting. So this is actually how I do it. I haven't shown anyone this because it's kind of big. I dragged it downstairs for you. Oh, good. So this, yes. This is a, so this is a, you know, our military, you know, when you think of frontline workers, it's a very broad category. It can be um, physicians, you know, we think of EMTs. Um, it can be military uh, personnel, mm -hmm. uh, but it also can be a grocery worker. It can be a delivery person. So frontline means that you have to do your job every day and you actually have the risk of contracting COVID. And if yeah. you didn't do your job, I mean, my mother said, you know, she didn't have people and most of us delivering your medicine by mail or your food right. or supplies. It would very much affect all of our lives, and that's, and that's right. why I always I always say thank you for being there. You know, with, I always thumbs up. If you even just hold up a piece of paper, if you don't even do a panel, if you find ways just to thank frontline workers. Um, so this is an example. I just started this a couple of days ago, and then when I and I've actually, if you want to look, um, we have a wonderful video that David Mazur uh, has created for me. Um, oh. He does our, and so that's I call it the sizzle reel, and you can actually see a time lapse when I'm painting these. Uh, oh, you know, what a hours. great idea. But it's, yeah, yeah. So it's fun to watch them. Uh, I, what I call it is I'm bringing their story to life. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, that's so important. It's so wonderful. Well, so can you tell want... us like you received the picture, right? Yes. And well, so what then- people do, um, All yeah. you have to do is you go to our website and yeah. you can just, um, I, I think we have a new tab now, but um, it, you can uh, re request, um, I think it's called Make a Pan. I should look today. We just changed this, but go to our website and you can also send an email. We have contact us. So you send an email to information at our COVID quilt project. And it's very easy to see that through contact us. Mm -hmm. um, there's also submit a panel when people want to upload their own and they can use digital ones. You can do a photograph. You don't have to be able to draw or okay. sew. You, you know, if you want to do a kid's project, uh, like I'm making a little kit here that we're going to be sending out. It's a, my pizza box kit. Okay. So, uh, so I'm, I'm coming up a way that people, you know, I could, we have several pieces of fabric for the kids. We'll give them little stencils and tracing paper to help them. Oh, nice. And then paints and, um, you know, and brushes. So it could be a wonderful project in the middle of winter time when, you know, yes. when they've been home forever. And I give them little shapes and things that they could do from trucks um, and badges. Um, so, and I then think that's a and, wonderful and, idea. And the little puff paints, kids love puff paints. Um, yeah, so, I but, have uh, I have five grandbabies, and I, I maybe I'll yeah. order some for them. Yeah. You know, because I think that it's it's really important at that age for them to understand that they're doing something that. Um, that is affecting the world right now. You yes. Know? Well, yes. Uh, well, and I, several of them are in quilts. I mean, I have, well, we've had children as young as, one of my favorite pictures was a firefighter with his two-year-old baby and the two of them were making a panel together. Aww. I mean, she, she's doing all these dots, but it was such a wonder, it was for her daddy. And yeah. I've, had, I've had nurses do them for their husband who's a nurse. Mm. Uh, so I, I think that's, 
you know, teaching children that, and they're lovely, you know, I, I mean, if people want to look at, you know, as some of what we've got a wonderful, um, we've done some Facebook lives where kids will say, I want to thank all the doctors and nurses keeping us safe. But when you hear it out of the mouths of babes, if you're a doctor or a nurse, I think it just makes you feel like, you know, gee, it's really worth going if somebody cares. That's right. You know, right. You know, yeah. ha because our, these workers, especially in hospitals, which is why I'm really flattered. I, I really, really wanted Breast and Hospital to take this with us. Let us put them out there for two weeks, showing hope on a hill. So when the yeah. employees, and I want, so when they go to work, they're going to pass it lit up at night. And when they come oh. home, they'll see it in their rear view mirror. So I want them to have hope that somebody knows what they're doing. And that, and because that, because it's going to get harder as when we know that this next phase is not easy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what a so, wonderful idea to, of course, to put it right next to the hospital. Right. Well, oh, and because, yeah. so, and it's up high because we didn't want to have people, of course, running out of their cars. You know, we don't want to add to their problems. So we put it in a place that it's on public display. Now, if people want to see, we have two, we actually have two sets of letters now. Um, one of them is in Alexandria. And okay. it's at the Delray Artisans, which is, oh, yeah. you know, that's a wonderful neighborhood. They have fun restaurants around there. If you want to get yeah. up close, up close, you can go there and park your car and you can look at our, um, all the panels are on, you know, there are different panels there. So when people make them, I change them out. Uh, I make okay. copies of them to be out in the rain. Nice. Uh, because yeah. you know because now i consider these like you know these are our treasures to me um yeah. even when i even like i have a whole you know i have great i have this wonderful people on my team i have um i have a, a, a mom a single mom with four kids i have her 13 and 15 year old and i think nine they're all cutting out the fabric for me they're my assem oh, junior oh. assembly team cool. uh, so and they've made some of my most beautiful panels and it's wonderful having them involved in the uh, it they they were on the stage with me at the Lincoln Memorial. Um, mm. So, so, so special. I have, I have they'll some always members. remember that. Well, and I have some senior citizens, I mean, or people working on quilts in order to make the quilt assembly safe, we can't do it as a quilting bee. So mm. it, it's a very, we, it's a very, uh, these uh, Priscilla and, and Jeannie's done, done a wonderful project where they separate each phase. They, we leave the one part outside, the next, then they come and pick it up and then they work with no one. There's, I really wanna make sure it's completely COVID safe, but you could do yeah. this across the country with siblings and you could, if people lost a relative, what I really love people to do is make their own honor quilt and, yes. and have like, piece of, like a button from your aunt or maybe a piece of fabric that she enjoyed or part of a mm -hmm. scarf. And then you all kind of collaborate and talk about her and grieve together and celebrate her. And, um, oh. and that's what I'm trying to do even with these, even when I talk to these families and I'll say to them, well, isn't, you know, I try to, even in doing that say, well, isn't that wonderful? In fact, when she said, we don't have a picture of my brother in scrubs, I said, but he was a doctor. She said, well, he never talked about that, which is really another example of what an unusual man, right? That he was right. so humble. So special, uh, yeah. So special. So, and she said, gee, I never thought of him that way. So even having people have those dialogues in their family, I think would be very therapeutic. And, and having children, children I've learned, so we've been doing these little sip and panel events at my wineries and other places at the, you know, and at, at the Lincoln Memorial, at the, and at the Jefferson Memorial. And what things that come out of children, it really shows you there's a lot of anxiety over this. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I, I, one of my favorite windows is a, I have a, an eight-year-old boy draw all his first line workers, there was a fireman, there was a doctor, little stick figures, and they were all in Zoom windows. And oh. his life, it was interesting to think an eight-year-old, he thinks Zoom is normal. I mean, that's how I he sees know. it. Now, it's such almost, a new world. It's a, what a strange sociological aspect that a child thinks that this is normal, that all yeah. his caregivers and his grandparents and his friends are in a Zoom window. That's and right. it so to me, it's, you know, if we, that's an interesting um, way of, of looking at this from a historical time capsule, because yeah. that is, that really isn't normal, <laughs> but, and if he hadn't drawn that, and to him, it was really cool. And I thought how interesting in, in eight months, he's completely adapted that as his normal life. That's his children right. quickly adapted. And I thought, what a poignant message out of this small little boy who was so earnest in every detail explaining to me how, you know, in such detail, there's a lot inside kids that probably needs, I call this art therapy. For all oh, the very much so.
Very much so. so yeah. Then, no. And so if you want to go to our gallery on the website, you'll find these panels and his is his is there, you know, with his figures. It's adorable. But so and it shows you all these messages through I think the youngest has been two to ninety-five. Yeah. Well, this is such a wonderful endeavor that you've taken on that you've started. A lot of work. Uh, and, well, and, and yes, and, I, and I'm and I'm, we've, I'm so excited to say we have some. We, I've been funding this completely myself. I bet my husband and I have spent sixty thousand dollars, which is a lot of money to us. But to, and, but to me, this was a gift for my mother, and she says, "Diane, this is a gift for the country." So I said, "Mom, you know, at your age, and you know, she won't let me buy her things, and I, we've worked very hard for our money." I said, "But I think this is worth it." So that's what this is. It's a legacy for her and for me uh, to think of how do we make people feel better. And, uh, and come together over a common crisis. Yeah, you know, really, I, I just feel like this is such a beautiful thing that you're doing. I mean, on so many levels, even from the art therapy to working on the grieving to it being a family event, a community event, all ages can participate. And no matter what your skill level is of art, right. you know, and it's something that really is going to go in the history books. I, I really feel like it will because this is such a, a, a tremendous time of change in our world. It is. It is. And, um, and this is something that, you know, because the, the connectivity or that, you know, the fact that we're one humanity, I think that's yes, what yeah. you're highlighting, you know? Yes. Um, well, yes. And, I, and everybody counts. In my opinion, yeah. every, every life that's affected or those who you know, make it, they all counted. And, and what I think is more unnerving, at least to me, is we don't know the effect of having had coronavirus unless we study it. Um, mm -hmm. So even on whether you're a child or an adult, and, and, I, and I think it's sad to, you know, to see these smiling faces and that a person 39, their life ended so young. Yeah. Uh, and now in, in her case, she had MS. So mm -hmm. you know, have, having, we know having, but some people, I mean, I, I painted a picture of a man that was, he, he was six, seven, 280 pounds and, and, uh, and he, he died, his, his mother got it and she was almost, a, she wasn't tested, he brought mm -hmm. her home and he dies. They probably mm -hmm. looked at this mountain of a man and thought he's not going to get sick because he looked so strong. Right. So, yeah, so I yeah. think people, whether you're six, seven or tiny, you know, we're all vulnerable and, and how do we, how do we do something to the people taking care of us, um, like the hospital workers, I mean, they are our caregivers. How do we give back so that they know that we, that we are, that, in fact, one of the things I've asked, I've even sent a legislative request to our Congressman, um, you know, or Senator Kane and others. I think they should make the 19th of every month a day of honor that mm. we, until we have a cure and a treatment for all Americans, that on the 19th, we honor frontline workers right now and, and oh, so i love the idea i think we should get get that out yeah definitely. Uh, so if you can have you can help me get that message out i've yeah. sent letters i'm working through the right channels but i think i think that wouldn't be hard to do uh, a proclamation even starting in virginia i work on that but what would right. be hard with having just it could be just the 19th how do we bang on pots once right. a month so people know to keep the you know people showing up at our door and the grocery yeah. workers and our teachers going you know teachers now are worried about their health you know all yeah. these people we count on so keeping it top of mind and yes. and and you know i think what you're doing is that you make it real you know because these are real people that you're seeing they are yeah. on the quilt so oh yeah so what, well, what a beautiful yes. thing wonderful people yes uh yes and, and and you know the common thread with most of these every one of these people so far are people that probably could have, you know, dodged the bullet. They all could have called out sick. They didn't have to do what they did. Uh, I, I did a respiratory therapist who was one year short of retiring. Um, she, her kids begged her and she said, I have to, and she, you know, of all the people, she helped people breathe and she died of not being able to breathe. It's, it's such a very sad story, but what I tell her children is, what a noble, special person to have given so much. She gave the ultimate, she made the ultimate sacrifice. That's right. That's and right. and now she, I'm hoping she'll live on the wall of the Smithsonian one day. So the son of, uh, of that young man, I told you who was six, seven, his five-year-old boy can see mm -hmm. his daddy's face somewhere knowing what a you know special man he was and he wasn't That's forgotten. Right. 
That's right. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Diane, for taking the time to chat with me. Well, I'm so honored really. that you invite me. Oh, you're such a beacon of light. You really are. I mean, this Very is nice. a, a beautiful, you know, heart work that you're doing. And um, just oh, I love that. I love that. Me. I love that we do heart work. That's going to be my new line. I love that we're doing heart work. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> That's what it seems like to me. That's and um, I just, you know, this is a, a, a challenging time. I, I always say it's a time to be gentle with ourselves. Yes. And it's a powerful time to love each other, to unite right. and, and right. to live in peace. And yes. Uh, well, my, my 95 year old mother would say it's much easier to be kind than unkind. So, you know, it's taking it from a 95 year old who's gone through a, a tremendously sad life in many ways, but that was her comment. And uh, she's always said, she said when she's never said anything like this pandemic at the age of 95, she's lived through, the, you know, depression, smallpox, terrible, deadly flus. But she said, she's always people came together to help each other, which she right. said, what, and she said, Diane, help me, help us have people come together because this is kind of a big thing. And it's time that we do that. It's time yeah. to heal and come together. So yeah. that's my, that's my, that's, that's where this, that, that's really my mother's gift is asking people to just be kind. That's wonderful. Um, and um, I, I always ask people, what are your words of wisdom? And it sounds like partly what you, what you just said. Yes, but but I, well, and you know, I've always loved the quote by Gandhi, uh, be the change you want to see in the world. Um, uh, yeah. I don't, and because I, you know, whether you have modest means, uh, it doesn't take money or power but just small changes at a time. You know, sometimes I'll watch a person struggling, kids trying, just, I pay for their whatever, I'll just say, just add it to my bill. You know, there are moments when you can take that step uh, and pay forward for somebody who maybe they'll do it for somebody else. You know, I love the idea of paying forward. And I've been fortunate enough, my husband and I, to travel the world. Um, you know, we're trying to help endangered species or endangered cultures, I guess. So sometimes I've found the most impoverished people have been the most generous whether they're in India, you know, it's a very moving thing to me. It, it isn't money and power that makes people happy. Sometimes it's people of the most um, modest means. Um, in fact, I was very inspired by the gentleman who was six, six, seven, his name is Thomas. His father is, um, uh, is a sanitation worker for many years. He came to see me and, the, you know, I looked at him and thought, you've lost your son. He was one of the most compassionate, kind, warm men uh, and people I've ever met, as particularly with this loss. And I looked at him and thought, you know, there's people who would look at, you know, and, and a very proud, wonderful man. I was so honored for me to do this for him. He brought his mother there and pushed her a half mile in a wheelchair to look at the picture I had drawn because oh. they missed they missed their son so much. Right. That, and, and he said, are you the lady who painted my boy? And I, oh. no, I just looked, I didn't know who he was. And I looked at him, but he had, this little, he had a picture of, of Thomas on his shirt. And I said, yes, sir. And I'm honored to do so. And it just, that, that man was so, so full of, touching. Wow. And he's so full, but see, he's so full of warmth and compassion that he could be bitter and mm -hmm. angry. And all the things you can do, you have a choice in life. You can either take an opportunity during a crisis. That's, I love that the Chinese symbol for, for um, crisis is the same as opportunity. Oh, so, oh, very good. Yes. Yeah, so, so if you think of life, you have two choices. You can be embittered by it, or you can turn it around and try to be positive, as Mr. Fields has with the loss of his son. And a grandson with no father, so wow. he, he's one of my. He was one of my beacons of light. And, and looking at him, thinking, how can you be this person, when knowing you have such darkness around you? Right. And, and so he's he's the change he wants to see in the world. That's right. Yeah. Beautiful. Well, thank you well, again so much, Diane, for you. joining me. I honor the light in you. Thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity. And you keep doing what you do. You need to bring light to the world. This is a really oh, special time. Thank you, thank so, you much. so much. So Take much. care. Thank you so much for listening to Uno Souls Chat. You can find us at www.unosouls.com and on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. I would love to hear from you if you would like to chat with me. Have a beautiful week and see you at the next episode.